And so sometimes fears aren't just you know, things that, um, that you were afraid of from the first instant. It could be something that is, a, is um, attached to a lot of trauma. Today's talk is about conquering fear. And uh, I will talk about the different kinds of fear, why we have fear. I'll also be telling you about how the fear serves us. And then we'll go a little bit into how we can deal with fear, what kind of um, skills or, or talents we need to acquire to be better at dealing with our fears. And finally, how we can actually shift our lives from living out of fear instead moving into living out of love. How does that sound? Good? Great? Perfect. How many of you have a conscious fear in your life? Like something very specific. Like, you know, afraid of cockroaches, afraid of heights, afraid of death, afraid of uh, uncertainty, afraid of failure, success. Can you raise your hand for me if you have a fear that you are aware of? Good. I'm happy to see some of my theta healers are not raising their hand, which means I taught you well. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually the only people who didn't raise their hands. <laughs> but even then, I'm sure we could, uh, I could find some fears for them to work on in class, right? <laughs> fears are in layers. So you may clear up some fears, and there will be other fears underneath it. And your fears may go from very specific, very tangible, all the way down to the very intangible, things that you can't quite make sense of things that you can't quite um, define, but they're there, okay? So let me start off by telling you about um, the types of fears that exist. First of all, we have fears that can be traced back to a specific incident. So there was a trigger incident. For example, you got bitten by a dog. And then from that point, you know, you're afraid of dogs, which is actually what happened to me. Um, I didn't get bitten by a dog, but I got chased by a dog when I was very, very young. Um, it was a big dog and I was small, so, you know, I was very terrified about this dog that was chasing me. And I knew I couldn't outrun the dog, um, but luckily enough, I had an adult there who saved me from the dog, and um, I was safe. But that memory of my heart pounding and how terrified I was at that moment became the trigger point for my fear of dogs. It got so bad that if there was a dog around me, I would freeze and I couldn't move, you know, and I would panic. Other times I would hide behind someone if there was a dog around me. And I remember there was this one, one particular incident where um, I was dating somebody who loved dogs. And this was a bit of a problem because, you know, that's kind of like a deal breaker in the relationship. You're with a dog lover and you're afraid of dogs. You know, so anyway, that relationship did not go anywhere, okay? Um, and I have my fear of dogs as one of, those, uh, one of those challenges in our relationship, okay? Now, when I actually went into that fear of dogs, I um, realized it was a little bit more than just the trigger incident and then the fear developing from it. So what happened when I was a little bit older is um, I used to spend my summers in Indonesia, in Jakarta, because that's my, my, where my mother was born. And so I have like lots of cousins there. She has 10 brothers and sisters. Yeah, you know, in those days where there was no TV or, you know, phones or social media, right? What else would they do, right? Except make babies, which is what they did. So as you can imagine, my mother has 10 brothers and sisters, all are married, all have children. And so I would go back home to Jakarta, and it was home for me, and I would have a great time. Now, one of my cousins, who I would stay with, had a dog. And um, he was a tiny little dog. His name was Smokey. Uh, he was more a nuisance rather than something I was afraid of. Like, a, you know, it wasn't a big, threatening dog. He was just kind of like small and tiny and barked a lot. And because I spent like two or three summers, I actually grew to love this little dog called Smokey. Despite my fear of dogs, I actually grew to love this dog. And um, he was really a source of a lot of delight for me. And my whole summer was like playing with Smokey. And, you know, I had very good memories 
of Smokey. And then I left and went back home to Japan, back to school, and I was back in uh, school for a year. And then it was the following summer, and I went back to Jakarta. And uh, my first question was, you know, where's Smokey? I can't wait to meet Smokey. You know, I'm so excited to see him. But nobody would give me a straight answer. And um, my cousins weren't really saying anything. My mom was very evasive. I knew something was up, and I felt really uncomfortable because I couldn't get a straight answer. Now, I think it was like the second or third day that I was there. Um, we were at my mom's brother's house, and, and they sat me down, and they said, you know, we have to tell you something. And I knew, obviously, it was something very serious. And then my mom and my aunt told me that Smokey had died in a car accident the last year. So apparently after that summer, maybe like the following month or something, he um, ran out to the road and he got run over by a car. Okay, and, and he died. Okay, nobody told me for a whole year. My mom knew, but obviously she wanted to protect me. She didn't want me to go through that. And when I heard the news, I cried my heart out. Okay, I was devastated. Okay, and that really affected me for that summer. So my fear of dogs after that grew tenfold. So I had this fear from that incident, and then when Smokey died, it's like my brain said, we're definitely not going to go anywhere near a dog. Because not only am I afraid of it to begin with, but secondly, the loss of Smokey was more than I could bear as a child. And so that is why I was really terrified of dogs. Okay, so it was both a terrifying incident and a very sad incident that led up to my fear. And so sometimes fears aren't just you know, things that, um, that you were afraid of from the first instant. It could be something that is, a, is um, attached to a lot of trauma. Okay? And it doesn't have to be um, an incident where something <coughs> negative happened to you directly with that, that fear, but it could be a trauma even around that time so let's say I had a dog and then at the same time there was another loss in my life and I could attach the loss in my life to the dog and then start to fear the dog okay so it can happen that way too right now those kind of fears are kind of really easy to deal with you go back to the incidents so when I healed that fear of dogs I went back to that first incident where I was being chased by the dog. I took out, you know, I dealt with all those feelings of, you know, oh my God, this dog's gonna bite me, it's gonna hurt, I'm gonna die. You know, all those kind of crazy thoughts associated with being in that situation of being afraid of the dog. So the first thing was neutralize that. Remove all those negative feelings, remove every bit of trauma that I was carrying. And then make my peace with that. Then I had to go to the incident with Smokey. Okay, and I had to go and confront the loss because as a child you don't really know how to deal with loss and I don't think my mother knew how to explain that loss to me properly like I had no comfort you know it was just kind of like you got run over by a dog and that was the end of it there was no explanation you know that he was okay he was safe you know he had a body but his he's free and there were so many ways that you know, I could have processed it maybe a little bit better, but uh, due to my lack of understanding at that point, and also because my mother probably didn't understand how attached I was to this dog, okay? And so I never really got to deal with the, the, the grief, okay? And so I had to revisit that, I had to release it, I had to make my peace with that incident as well. And after that, I have a dog. I actually have a dog at home now. His name is Sky. My son um, was fascinated with dogs when he was about a, a year, a year and a half, and then I had a second child, and um, he liked dogs too, so we decided to get a dog. And the dog came from one of my students whose uh, dog had a, a litter, litter, right, for dogs? Yeah. And so she gave me a really cute puppy, and so I lived with a puppy in my house. Okay, and I carry him and I pet him and I'm completely comfortable with him. So you can, uh, you know, you can definitely resolve and release fears.
such a, as those when there is a triggering incident very easily. Okay? It usually takes one session. Sometimes even um, there's a technique called EFT. Very simple to do. With EFT, you can release a fear in about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay? Um, so those fears you really don't have to worry about too much because they can be easily managed, handled, and released. Now there's another kind of fear which um, has no incident, no triggering incident. Okay? So the first fear I talked about is something that we learn from an experience. This other kind of fear that I'm introducing to you right now is more of what we call a phobia. It's a fear that you have no known cause for it or reason for even fearing that particular situation or um, that particular um, stimulus. Okay, so an example would be somebody who, um, who's never been in a plane crash, but the minute they get on the plane, they start to palpitate, panic, you know, they may have a breakdown, and so they have this fear of heights or fear of flying, but they've never really had a bad experience. Okay? I do have a client, for example, who had uh, some very bad experience with turbulence on a flight and then developed a fear of, of flying. But again, that's the first kind of fear. There's a triggering incident we could go back to. But the kind of fear that develops without really any, any understanding of it, that's the one that's really confusing. Okay? And um, a lot of people carry fears that they cannot explain. They don't know where it started, why they have it. Uh, they just know it's there. And those fears are usually very strong. Okay? Those kind of fears are sticky. So if we do a round of EFT or we do some you know, healing work on that, it's a little bit more of a challenge to work through. Those kind of fears are phobias. Most of them originate in a past life. For example, I have uh, worked with clients who have a fear of water. And so when we went back to figure out where it's coming from, they've never had a bad experience in this lifetime. Some never even been close to the ocean, okay? So they had no particular first-hand experience that they could go back to. But what happened when we go into a healing session and kind of you know, explore where it came from? They drowned in a, in a past life. So that explains the fear of water, right? They drowned, their last memory before they died is, you know, I'm dying and I'm in water. Some people have um, even physical manifestations of the fear. So I had a client who came in to see me um, with really severe eczema on her entire body. Do you know what eczema is? Yes. Yeah? It's like atopic, atopic dermatitis is the medical term, and your entire body is, is inflamed. Um, some people get it localized in certain areas, but this particular client had it so bad, it was like head to toe eczema. And um, she had it from a very young age. And when we went to figure out where it's coming from, she was burned alive in, a, in another life. And the trauma of the burning sensation on her skin was coded into her DNA. And when she was born again in this life, she retained the cellular memories of the trauma on her skin as the eczema. Okay? So that is a fear that manifests as an illness. Okay? Sometimes we could have a fear of the dark, okay? and uh, that could also be related to um, being buried alive. So all this weird stuff would happen, you know, all in those lifetimes. I mean, all the Egyptians were buried alive, right? So they were they were mummified alive, or when they were really sick, okay? or they would, could be buried alive. Um, people died some very, very, um, not very nice deaths in those, in those days. Right? People were speared, witches in Salem were burned alive. So we have a lot of tragedy in our history. Okay? I mean, if you were there at the French Revolution, you were guillotined. I mean, we had some pretty inventive ways of killing people back then. Right? And so... There are a lot of those fears that we retain from those experiences. Sometimes they manifest as the illness, like the eczema case, um, or it could also manifest as a fear of that particular situation. Okay. 
I had a, a client who's a doctor, and um, she had a cataract in her eye. And when we did some healing work in, um, in a class that I attended, it turns out she had three different past lives. The first one, she was speared in her eye. The second one, she was blinded, like they gouged out her eyes. And the third one, um, I think it was like acid in her eyes. And so what happened is she had had eye problems constantly in this current life, coming from those unresolved past lives. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me for a minute. So in summary, there are fears that originate in this life. They're learned fears. They are simpler to clear. And we can normally find a triggering incident where the fear was learned or developed. And then we have the other kind of fear where we can't really understand the source. And to really understand where that's coming from, we usually have to go into a past life regression or through a healing session. It sort of shows up in, um, in the session as it unravels itself in the session. Okay. Now, um, why do we have fears? Okay. Any ideas? Why do you think you have fears? How does it serve you? Like, what do you get out of these fears? Any thoughts? To keep us safe. That's actually the number one reason. Okay. We're meant to have a little bit of fear. For example, if you are in a very, um, a very, I don't know, unsafe part of town, right? That little bit of fear makes you more cautious, right? Like if you see a dark alley, you're not gonna go down a dark alley in the middle of the night because that's not safe. And that fear is gonna keep you from doing something stupid like that, right? So you wanna have a little bit of fear. But having too much fear is where you have the problem. The problem with having a lot of fear is that it is constantly overworking your adrenal glands. Every time you feel fear, your body actually releases a little bit of adrenaline and then cortisol, okay? Because fear creates stress. And our body's normal response to stress is to give you a bit of adrenaline to deal with the stress. Usually you will pick one of our two survival instincts. You fight or you flight, right? And you need a bit of extra energy to run really fast if you're gonna flight, right? So we get a bit of adrenaline and then the adrenaline runs out and then the cortisol comes in. Now, if your body's constantly in a state of fear, which is then constant stress on the body, then you're never going to stop producing adrenaline and cortisol. Your body never goes back to what we call as homeostasis, or the rest state, okay? And so you're constantly in this mode of having to survive. And that actually causes some huge problems in our body. Not only will your adrenal glands get overworked and exhausted, but then it will start to affect all the other endocrine glands. And the overproduction of cortisol and adrenaline in the body will actually upset the balance of the hormones in other areas of the body as well. And so then you get you know, a lot of like different diseases like thyroid problems, people can get heart problems, people can get liver, like cholesterol, high cholesterol can result. And there's really a whole host of issues that can show up, including some things like having insomnia, difficulty sleeping, you could also have like uh, irregular cycles, monthly cycles for women, you could tend to actually gain a lot of weight because of hormonal imbalance. So there's really a ton of stuff that could happen as a result of constantly being in that state of fear. But fear was really meant to keep us safe. But it was meant to keep us safe from unsafe situations, not situations that we have falsely decided is unsafe, okay? And most of the people who have a lot of fears in their life, their fears are unfounded, okay? Their fears are just sort of keeping them from moving forward. So the second thing that fear does for you, other than keep you safe, is to keep you stuck, okay? And so if you're afraid of success, or you're afraid of failure, or you're afraid of the future, or you're afraid of uncertainty, then having a lot of fear is gonna keep you right where you are. It's not gonna move you forward because out there it's scary. Out there we cannot control things. Out there we are vulnerable to whatever may happen because it's out of our hands, out of control. Okay? So fear always serves a purpose. If it's making you feel safe, 
then you need to find something else that will make you feel safe. Trust or confidence would actually help you to feel safe. It doesn't have to be fear. If you developed more confidence in yourself, that would keep you safe. If you could trust God or the universe or even yourself, your own efforts, your own ability to take charge of any situation, that could replace fear. So you need to find something else that will make you feel safe and secure. And usually the best one is spirituality. Developing a relationship with yourself, developing a universe, a, a relationship with the universe, building that trust, and developing your own connection with the creator, okay? That is what can keep you safe. And it shouldn't be through somebody else, okay? So I also do have clients who, um, anytime something goes wrong in their life or they have a problem, they run to someone else to tell them what to do. That's giving your power away, okay? Not your friends, not your family, not your counselor, not even your therapist should be telling you what to do with your life, okay? Not even your healer, okay? One of the most important things for me is when I'm in a healing session with a client, I never tell them what to do. To do so would make them just as unempowered as when they came in for the session. I need to empower them. I need to develop them to be more empowered and teach them to rely on themselves, not me. Okay? So it's very important to develop your confidence and trust in yourself. And building that starts with yourself and moves into your relationship with the Creator and also with the universe. Okay? And so if you have that, then you have a strong foundation. No matter what challenge you experience in your life, you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to deal with it in a positive way. So that's very, very important. The other, um, the other reason we hold on to our fears is because it keeps us stuck. Right? I mentioned that earlier. And so the reason we are stuck is because we have created all these excuses for why we don't want to move forward in our life. Okay? We want to stay in our comfort zone. We want to do what we're comfortable with. But let me let you in on the secret. Your mind will do something to make you uncomfortable just to get you out of your comfort zone. Because you're not meant to stagnate. You're meant to move. You know that, um, that law of physics, once in motion, always in motion? Okay, That's a law of the universe. We can't ever just stand still. We need to keep evolving. Okay? We need to keep moving forward. We need to progress. We cannot halt that natural evolution of being. And so if you don't evolve yourself, if you don't choose to constantly grow in a positive way, your brain will create all kinds of diversions and distractions and dramas and challenges to keep you busy. Okay? First of all, to keep you busy, and secondly, to get you moving. Right? So if you don't want to get you know, stuck with a mess in your life, keep learning, keep growing, keep evolving yourself, keep moving forward. That is the sure shot way to make your life smooth. Now, do you know what I mean by keep moving, keep evolving, keep learning, keep growing? What does that mean? What does that mean, guys? Yes? Oh, um, I guess. For me, it's more on facing your fears. Facing your fears? Yeah. It's any kind of personal growth. You know, it's like becoming better than you were yesterday. Learning something. Expanding your mind. Right? Like you can't stay in kindergarten for the entire life. Right? You gotta go to first grade and second grade and third grade. And you know, if you keep failing, you'll have to keep repeating. But eventually, you gotta move forward. Okay? And every time we get stuck in our life, we're just repeating the same grade over and over again until we learn enough to move up, okay? So my advice to you is always look for ways that you can improve yourself. You can improve upon your mind. You can improve upon your own skills and talents because that way you will avoid your mind creating these challenges to keep you stuck. Okay? or to push you out of where you are stuck. 
Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, I'm doing pretty well on my list. I hit types of fear, I hit purposes of fear, okay? Well, there's one more thing actually uh, I'd like to talk about, um, which I didn't get a chance to address at the beginning of this talk, which is the fact that we all are born with only two fears, okay? We are all born with the same two fears, Every other fear in our life is a learned fear. When I say it's a learned fear, that means I'm learning it from this life or I'm learning it from another life. But as a soul, there are only two fears that I come into existence with. Okay, is that clear to you? Okay, what do you think these two fears are? Is it one falling, like they say, or something like that? It is actually fear of falling. Falling in loud noises? Yes. Yeah, you remember it from the talk. Good job. Oh, <laughs> there are only two fears that us as souls come into this existence with. Fear of loud noise and fear of falling. For the soul, we don't have... The fear of falling is something entirely new connected to the body. The second thing is fear of loud noise is because in the spirit world, there is no sound. Okay? We all communicate telepathically. It's just energetic. There's no actual, we don't have ears through which we process sound. But the minute you're born, you hear things. And that's a real shock to the system, okay? And in fact, the first cry that the baby hears is his or her own. And that in itself is a shock to them, okay? Maybe they're crying at their own cry. <laughs> and so they keep crying. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but okay? So there are only two fears that we come into our bodies with, and that is the fear of falling and the fear of loud noise. Every other fear comes from somewhere, past life or present. Fair enough? Okay. Now, how do we work with our fears, how do we conquer fear? Which is really the topic today, right? Well, the first thing that you can do is to develop courage. Courage is a virtue. And courage is something that you can develop when you face your fears. So if you have a fear and you face it, you confront it, you're developing courage. It takes courage to face the fear. When I um, was a budding um, healer, speaker in Dubai, and um, I had come from a very left brain type of upbringing. I went to an Ivy League university. You know, I was a very like logical type of person. I worked in corporate America, you know, and then I kind of dropped everything to go and become a healer and a, and a teacher. And I remember my first talk like this. Um, was in a healing center I had just opened in Dubai, and there was maybe 40 to 50 people in the room. I was a lot younger, okay? And there were all these people, you know, who were clearly uh, either older, wiser, more intelligent, more successful, um, sitting, you know, on the floor uh, while I was giving my first official talk. It was called The Journey of the Soul. And I had written a whole, you know, script of what I was going to say. It was like pages and pages. My whole talk was, was on paper. And um, as I opened the space and I announced, you know, the beginning of my talk, I froze. It's like I had that notebook with all my notes and it's like the words literally blurred. I couldn't read anything. I couldn't understand what I had written. And I remember that panic setting in. And it was like, it's fear, okay? And I was so afraid that I would just not be able to even say anything. Stand, I would look so stupid standing in front of this room of 50 people. And there was my, you know, that was the, the success of my center was now going to be, uh, um, could, was going to be questionable whether I could even make anything out of it because I couldn't even give a talk. I was so scared in that moment. I remember feeling so much panic. And then I decided that I was just going to trust the universe. And, um, and I just started talking. I didn't look at my notes, and I talked for an hour and a half about the journey of the soul. And it was one of the most amazing talks that I did, because it came completely channeled. 
and um, I won over the audience. I mean, that was the talk that put me on the map in Dubai. And after that, you know, all these, because the room was full of skeptics, but so many of those people called me the next day, can I have a session? You know, people who were actually challenging me at that talk were the first people to call me the next day, saying, you know, I came in a skeptic and I walked out a believer. So I need a session, I need to work through my stuff. So I remember that that was a huge turning point for me because I faced my fear of public speaking, okay? I, um, up until that point, if I ever had to give a talk or a speech, it was like on no cards, you know, like highlighted. Like I was that kind of person, really organized, notes, highlights, everything written properly. And there I was, you know, I was completely speaking from a different place. And, um, and that taught me to trust. So when you face your fears, you learn trust, you learn and gain confidence. You learn a lot of really positive things about yourself and you now have that skill going forward. So the best way to conquer your fear is to face it, go into it, okay? But the key is really to understand that the fear exists and not to pretend that it doesn't, okay? So some people will avoid the situation and convince themselves they're not afraid of it, they just don't want to do it. Okay, or it's not for them, or they don't need to do it. And then you're just tricking your mind, okay? You're still running away or avoiding the fear, okay? And you're tricking your mind into believing it's not really a fear. Okay? So you have to be alert. And if you are alert, then you can identify those fears that are lurking in the recesses in those corners of your mind, okay? Anytime you have a resistance towards doing something, and it is coming out of a place of fear, that's something you should address as a fear, okay? If you choose not to do something because you know it's not good for you and there's confidence in that, there's trust in that, then don't work on that. But if there's any kind of negative feeling, okay? Some panic, some discomfort, something that you know you wanna like run away from the situation, that's a fear. You should definitely work on that. Now, I don't advise you to face all of your fears, because some fears are really just not, you know, not for you to have to deal with. For example, if you're afraid of sharks, you don't need to go and, you know, cage, what do you call it, like cage dive, shark dive? You don't need to do that. Because it's not like you're gonna really, like, run into sharks in your life. You know, it's not like a day-to-day -day occurrence that you have to solve, but, you know, deal with this fear of sharks. Having said that, if you want to, okay, if you want to go, I don't know, sit in the cage while sharks circle around you, and if you can do that, it will be a really liberating thing, okay? So you don't have to, make sure you're safe if you're gonna do it, okay? Don't go for one of those like, not really reliable, you know. <laughs> operators. Yeah, operators, go for someone that's really got, you know, those, what do you call it, trip, trip advisor ratings and stuff. <laughs> Make sure you do it safely. I will not be held responsible <laughs> if you do something, uh, you know, silly like that without any proper, uh, you know, proper consideration of what you're doing. So I'll tell you my story with that. When I was younger, um, in my 20s, a friend of mine gave me for a birthday gift a skydiving experience. And honestly, I was shitting bricks, literally, okay? Because I don't want to jump out of a plane at 15,000 feet. You know, it's not my idea of fun. But this friend of mine thought it would be really cool, and um, he was really into like, you know, adventure and things like that, and I don't want to seem like I'm you know, a scaredy cat, and you know, so I just put on a brave face and said, yes, this is a great birthday present, let's go do this. Meanwhile, inside I'm like, panic, you don't have to jump out of a plane, oh my God, like, I was already like, really stressed out. But, I decided to go for it. I figured something good will come of it, and I was already on a spiritual journey, so I knew intellectually that I would get something really great out of the experience. So, we had like a one and a half hour car drive, the whole car drive, I'm trying to prepare myself, it's going to be okay, it's safe, you know, you're going to be okay, this is a great birthday present, and the other part of me is like, 
why would I do this on my birthday? Like, why, 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 you know? And so we get there, and then they train you. You know, there's, there's a, somebody there. Like, it was a tandem skydive. So there was somebody there. But it was still really, like, frightening, you know, to see, like, the plane up there and people jumping out. Anyway, so we got on the, on the airplane, and um, there was a bunch of us. And uh, I didn't want to go, like, one of the first few, so I let everybody else go first. And I think it was me and another guy left. <laughs> and um, I thought I could chicken out, you know, and let everybody else go. And then, I don't know, part of me was like, maybe I could just make up an excuse. But it really was my turn. And I wasn't prepared, okay? Because I remember I, they make you sit at the, um, at the edge, like there's an open door and you sit at the edge and your legs are like dangling in the air. And I remember I was so, like my heart was pounding. I was really afraid. And the next thing I did was I looked down, which by the way, do not. <laughs> Don't do that. That's like torture. So then I looked down, I swear to God, all the blood rushed down. I thought I was going to pass out. But there's a guy attached to you because it's a tandem. And so he just kind of like pushed me out. And I remember I closed my eyes for a second and I said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to face it. And I opened my eyes. And it was the most beautiful experience, okay? So once I was there, it was amazing, okay? It was like you're flying, and it was just, it was, it was really one of those highlight experiences. And the best part of it, best part about that, is after that, it's like most of my fears disappeared. Just that one experience, caused all these other unrelated fears to disappear. Because if I could do that, then everything else was piece of cake, okay? So when you kind of do these daredevil type of stunts, you know, it actually really helps, again, to build that confidence, to kind of, you know, teach you that you're stronger than you think, that you can do a lot more than you ever thought was possible. And that even those things that are these great looming fears, when you go into them, it's not so bad after all. Right? It's not so bad. Okay? And so you learn. So you develop courage. So how did that experience translate to me um, having a lot of my fears get resolved in that one experience was because I developed courage. Right? Because I could do that, I now had the courage to face a lot more in my own life. So that's the first way to conquer your fear. Once you actually develop courage, then facing your fears is you know, not a problem. Right? It's very easy to do. You know you can do it. And you'll do it over and over again if you have to. But the thing is, do we have to? Do we really have to face all those fears when we've already developed courage? I hope not, right? Once we learn that we have the courage, we shouldn't need to keep proving it. We shouldn't need to keep facing things just to say, I can do it. And so the next step is to develop what we call is bravery. So there is a virtue that you develop after courage, and it's called bravery. When you're brave, you become fearless. Fear ceases to exist. Okay? When you have that quality of bravery, you can literally do anything. And these are words, courage, bravery. So what I'm actually talking about is the feeling. Okay? So I can't just say, you know, I'm going to go to the supermarket and pick up some courage or buy some <laughs> bravery. It doesn't work that way. It is something we develop emotionally, energetically. It's something we try on. We see if we can handle it, if it fits us. And as we move forward in our life, practicing that, it really becomes a part of who you are. I remember when I was younger, I was already on my spiritual path, but I remember so many different incidences and situations where my tummy would like tighten up in fear and there was like, I was afraid something would happen or someone would say something or there were a lot of different things that really, um, really scared me, okay? And I would feel it physically. 
But I noticed um, through these different experiences, the first one was through all the healing I went through on specific fears, and then actually going in and facing fears. The skydiving was not the only one. I went through a couple of different um, experiences that I can remember where I actually really confronted major fears, developed courage from it. And then I got to a point where I realized, well, I have the courage. Now I want bravery. Now I just want to be fearless. And when I developed bravery, I actually did it through uh, crystal layout passive regression. I was the demo for um, Vienna, who is the founder of Theta Healing. And I was her demo in one of the classes. And she took me back to an ancestor that had bravery. And it's in my DNA, because it's an ancestor of mine. And we brought the energy of bravery down my DNA into me. And we magnified this energy of bravery. And I remember that it took me one or two months to look back and say, wow, you know, I really have developed it. Because I noticed in those last, in those two months after that session um, that we, that I had with Bayana in front of the whole class, I remember that, you know, two, two months after that, that there were many incidences and there was no sign of that, you know, that butterfly or that discomfort and, you know, I was fine. And since then, I don't remember fearing anything, okay? I don't really remember fearing anything. Like, I was the type of person, if I went to one of those, like, tiger sanctuaries, I'm not going in the cage. I'm happy to be outside and, you know, like, taking pictures. I don't be in there petting that tiger or the lions, right? I'm not that, you know, I'm not that uh, uh, much of a daredevil to go and do that. But over time, those were things I was happening to. You know? I was putting myself in those situations that I wasn't feeling any fear at all. So I was testing over and over again. Wow, oh, this fear really isn't there anymore. I'm actually okay. I'm actually very comfortable. And the more I realized that fear had really, truly been conquered, okay, the more stronger I felt, the more powerful. And when I say powerful, I mean power in kind of like personal power, okay? I'm not talking about like power to manipulate people. I'm talking about that energy of like, you know, I can do anything. I'm strong, okay? I remember um, not too long ago, my father called me up and he was having some tests done for some ulcers in his mouth that wasn't healing, wasn't going. And, um, and he told me that it was potentially something that could be diagnosed as something very serious, okay? Like cancer. And I remember that the minute he told me about that, I was checking to see how I felt. And yes, there was a little bit of discomfort like, I don't want my father to go through anything like that. I don't want him to be sick. But I was looking for fear. Because, you know, fear plays up the most when it comes to people you love. Okay? Fear really plays up more than anything. When it means someone you love is in danger. Okay? And, um, and I was feeling discomfort, but I wasn't afraid. Okay, that was a real big understanding for me, that I wasn't afraid, because I could still talk to myself, say, you know what, whatever is meant to be is going to happen, okay, and I know the creator is going to take care of the situation in the best possible way, and I had that kind of confidence that whatever I could do in my power, like send him unconditional love, send him healing, I would do that, so I knew that I wasn't just sitting there helpless, you know, waiting for the diagnosis. Okay, or any tests. I knew that I could do whatever I had in my power, that there was something I could do to help him. And what was interesting is my father couldn't talk to anybody. He couldn't talk to my mom. He couldn't talk to my brother. He could only talk to me. Probably because I was the only member of the family that did not feel fear. Because he could probably energetically, not probably, he could sense it energetically. And when you are in a state of fear, you don't want to talk to somebody else who's in fear. You're looking for someone who can be your strength. You're looking for someone who can support you when you feel you're most vulnerable. 
Right? And if I was in the state of fear myself, but what if something happens? You know, what if what if he's sick? What if you know the doctor? You know, anything could happen. If I was in that mode, then I couldn't be his pillar of strength. And then he truly feel more fearful and maybe alone, and that would actually manifest probably mm -hmm. in a diagnosis that wouldn't have been very favorable. In the end, um, he did get a not a very good diagnosis. The doctor um, said, "Oh, we don't know what this is." You know, it's something we've not seen before. They were like really confused. And then I did a lot of healing on it for myself and also for my father. And within a week, uh, he found an ENT specialist who said, oh, look, we're just going to laser it off and it'll be okay. And they lasered it off and it was gone. And so it was nothing. It was nothing serious at all. <laughs> Meanwhile, his doctor, who was actually the mentor of the ENT doctor that he ended up seeing next, the mentor was like, oh my gosh, he was like panicking. But his protege, who headed up this other external clinic, just took a laser and burned it right off. And it cleared. Okay? And so there was nothing to be afraid of. I would have wasted a lot of time feeling fear. Right? And plus, I got to be my father's kind of rock. While he was going through something for the first time in his life, where he felt a little bit vulnerable. Okay? So, step one, develop courage by facing those fears. And when you actually have that courage, you'll start to move into bravery. You might need a little bit of help on the bravery, okay? You might need to do a little bit of like spiritual work or some healing work on that to develop bravery, but it comes after courage. It does come as you grow and develop yourself as an individual, okay? Especially spiritually, okay? Any questions so far? Make sense? Great. Which brings me to my very last point. So what is the goal at the end of the day when it comes to fear? I've talked to you about the kinds of fear. I've talked about how it serves you, what you're getting out of it. And then I've also talked to you about two different ways, um, sequential actually, of conquering that fear, dealing with it. Now I want to talk a little bit about the goal, the end goal of, of this whole story with fear. You have a choice. You can live your life out of two ways, either out of fear or out of love. That's your choice. When you live out of fear, there's so many things you won't do. And you will constantly live your life trying to protect yourself, defending yourself, keeping yourself safe, okay? So the goal would be, what can I avoid? What do I need to avoid? <coughs> and so, yeah, you'll keep yourself safe but you'll also hold yourself back from a lot of things. You won't take any risks, and so you won't bear those fruits of your labor as much as you would if you just kind of took that leap of faith. And a lot of major things require a leap of faith. It requires you to kind of put those fears aside and to jump right into it. Okay, and that is kind of the making of you. I mean, every movie, that you probably see has some element of the making of a hero, the making of a heroine, right? Every movie is like you start off as this one person, you go through these difficulties, challenges, and you come out stronger or better, okay? But it always requires that, in, that central character to, to grow and develop, okay? To face something, to kind of really um, take that major leap forward. Well, that's your story too. You have to do it too, okay? That is part of your evolution as an individual here on this planet. That's what you came here to do, okay? So you have to grab your fears by the horns. You have to do it. There's no other way. Otherwise, you live your entire life with what ifs, okay? With regrets. Or you never quite fulfill any of those dreams that you envisioned for yourself. All of that requires you to conquer your fear. That's the challenge that you must overcome. Okay? And so living out of love is about going into you, to situations in your life expecting the best, okay? expecting things to work for you, expecting things to actually, um, the universe to support you, expecting all those resources to come. 
you're not going to know that there's support out there for you until you're falling and somebody catches you. Okay? You'll never know about all that support that's there for you unless you're put into that situation where the support kicks in. Okay? So this is the process. This is the process of life. You have to activate these experiences to give you what you've come for. Okay? By living out of love, you will go into things that you know are good for you. By doing things out of fear, you'll probably get into mess after mess. I'm sure most of you can attest to the fact that every time you do something out of fear, it kind of backfires, right? It doesn't really work for you. Right? And so you are getting the message over and over and over again from your own experiences that you have to make a change. Living out of fear is not going to work for too long. Okay? Uh, in addition to that, the presence of fear in your body will actually lead to a lot of deterioration of your physical health. Okay? My, my mom was a very fearful person. Very fearful. When I was growing up, she'd be like, oh, don't do this, the police will see it. Don't do this, you know, this will happen. She would constantly stop me from doing things because she was afraid of what might happen. And I remember I'd get so annoyed and be like, mom, like, it's okay, I can do this, or I can manage this, or, you know, why are we thinking about things that haven't happened yet? I would get really annoyed until I grew up and kind of had a lot of that going on in my own head. Okay? So I did pick it up from my family, and I can't blame my mother because you know she went through a lot of challenges in her own life, which made her fearful. And of course, back then they didn't have resources like this. They didn't have anyone telling them, you know, that you could conquer the fear. They didn't have you know a healer to go go to. Most of them only had prayer and religion, okay? which was very helpful but not enough to shift their consciousness to where it needed to go, okay? Because that requires a lot of introspection, a lot of accountability, a lot of taking responsibility. Things that, you know, generations ago was not really very important or understood by people. But today we have this, you know, you have a center like this, you have videos that you can see on YouTube, you've got people all over social media talking about these things. You're getting this message in so many different forms. Okay, so take, take, take control of your fears. Take control of your life. Okay, conquer it. Go further. Go where you need to go. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, how do we magnify bravery without having to go through a fast life regression? When you um, face your fears, you develop a lot of courage. And when you get really good at facing those fears, and you really have plenty of courage, it turns into bravery. So I've been there and done that. I've been there and done that so much that it's like, oh, it doesn't face me. And that's where you start moving into feelings of bravery. Okay? In the past, we used to develop bravery through initiations, which required us to build courage. So in those tribal cultures, if you remember, right, they would have to go and like do all these different amazing feats, and they would, especially like the Native Americans, right, they'd have to like get on a, I don't know, get on an animal and control them. Like a lot of like the American rodeo is based on that, right? We've, we've had this in our history, okay? We've had to, um, gladiators, for example, these are all people that were being tested on their strength, on their courage, on their bravery. And the ones who prevailed were those who actually developed the courage and then the bravery. Okay? So it was a process. But, you know, people spent their lives learning courage than bravery. And I really don't want you to spend your life learning that because there's plenty more to learn. So with the advantage of, um, of healings and past life regressions and 
all these different do tools at your fingertips, like fake healing, for example, you can learn these things really quickly. Like I learned, I acquired courage in maybe, I would say I acquired courage in about two years, and I acquired bravery maybe in like six months. It's not long at all. Not bad, right, for two and a half years, okay? And that was a long time ago, which means I've retained it, okay? Does that mean I will never ever feel fear? Of course not. I'm gonna feel fear when I need to. I'm gonna feel fear when I have to pay attention to something or when I have to proceed with caution, okay? And I will, as will all of you, go through challenges that won't be necessarily very pleasant. Having said that, it won't be entirely unpleasant because I have the ability to look for the good, to look for the positive, to see the benefit in that situation. So there are a lot of things that we can develop along with that courage and bravery. It's the ability to see beyond something. It's the ability to understand, okay? It's the ability to kind of see the bigger picture on things, okay? And then it becomes easy. Yes, go ahead. Um, you mentioned earlier, the, like, you trusted that God would take care of your father, right? So how do we balance that, knowing that people also create their reality? Yes. Respecting. Respecting their free will. So we believe that God will take care of them. Okay. In best case scenario. But we also have to accept the other person's free will choice. Okay? For example, um, I asked my father, would you like me to do a healing on you? And he said, no, no, I'm okay. I respect that. Okay? But I still sent him lots of unconditional love, and I did healing on myself. So I did what I could do in that situation. Okay? And then I just left it up to the creator. Okay? And if anyone who you love is meant to get sick, then you make your peace with that, and you do your best to be there for them. And to give them whatever they will take from you. Okay? And so, you learn especially if you're a healer, as you are, you will learn to respect other people's free will. Like I'm married with uh, two little kids, and um, my son actually, since the last couple of days, has been kind of fighting off a fever, and in the last two days it got particularly bad. And so last night, he, I heard him crying at like 2.30 a.m., and I went to him, and he was just crying, and he was just really uncomfortable, and his tummy was uncomfortable. And so um, I held him, because that's what he wanted. I held him, I caressed him, and then I asked him if I could do a healing on him. And he's about two and a half now. And first he was like, no, no, no. And finally he said, yes. And so I did a healing on him, and he calmed down. He was able to go to sleep. He was way better. And he slept through, okay? Like he was phenomenally better. This morning he was okay, and then the fever came back again. And um, he had to go to a birthday party. And I said, you know, you can't go to the birthday party because you've got a fever. And I said, but do you want me to heal you? And he said, no. And I kept trying to ask him, can I heal you and you'll feel better? You can go to the birthday party. You know, you can have so many, you know, I really tried to like entice him. But he said, no. My child he said, no. <laughs> so it's nothing I can do. I just held him. I send him unconditional love because I'm allowed to do that without his permission. Anything more than that, I need his permission. And so I respected that. Can you imagine, like, as a mother, you want to do anything for your child, but you learn to respect. And if my child needs to go through this discomfort and he's choosing it, I allow him. But I'm still going to be there to hold him and I'm going to, you know, cuddle him and I'm going to be there in every way he wants. But I cannot heal him. Same with my husband. My husband's always coming to me whenever he needs like help with something in his life. But there are times he like forgets for a while and he tries to do it on his own. And then, you know, there's a lot of stress or like, you know, things are a little bit difficult. And I don't say anything because I'm trained to respect free will. And when he says, babe, I need help now, that's when I'll step in. And then it really gets sorted out like right away. And I know he thinks in his head, like, why did I just take so long? <laughs> you know, and so he's better. It's, we've been married for nine years. Now it's, like, very quick for him to ask for help. 
Um, in the beginning, it took him a little bit longer because, you know, he comes from that mindset that you don't ask for help. Someone should offer help, right? You don't want to, like, ask somebody to help you all the time. It makes you feel vulnerable and weak. But in Theta Healing, you got to ask because we're not allowed to do anything without your permission because you have a free will choice to be as miserable as you choose to be. <laughs> and all we can do is smile and say, if only. <laughs> okay? But my husband's really good at it. He's really good at asking for help. Okay? So his life's a lot easier. But there are certain things he's stubborn about, and you know, it's okay. It's, it's okay. Okay? I'm not perfect either. I drink a lot more coffee than I should. But you know, I'm okay with that. Okay? We can't be so perfect. But we can be pretty perfect. Okay? We can be pretty good. All right? Any other questions before I close? So yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, does it normally or usually um, carry over to your other aspects of your life when you're able to conquer fear? Like, for example, in my case, yep, I was able to conquer my fear of adrenaline pumping activities. Okay. Yep, and then um, I remembered because I live near the airport and I don't like it when I get stuck in traffic along the runway of Naia 3 because I'll be seeing the airplanes coming by with the wheels out and then they might not hit the the cars. <laughs> Which but, happened, you know, in New York City. Yes. That actually happened. Yes. And I also experienced the sand dunes in Ilocos where I'm never going to do it again. And what else? Yep. Um, climbing in a mountain where if you only take a few steps to the right, we'll be rolling down the <laughs> so I, I was able to release that fear. It ended up because um, my aunt who took care of me growing up, she I sort of inherited that fear from her of um, like um, very I don't know. She she does not want to um, even take her hands out of the window in the car because the fire that kind of paranoia. Okay. So there. So I was able to release that. So uh, my question is, does it carry over to Absolutely. other aspects of it? Absolutely. You'll notice it. You'll notice that a lot of other things will, will a lot of areas will benefit from that. Because, you know, everything is interconnected. Yes. You know, you build confidence in one area, it reflects in another area. And so we are all like an interconnected web of ideas and energies. And so helping in any way kind of upgrades the entire uh, neural pattern in your head. You know, so just addressing one area will kind of help everything. Absolutely. Good. Hey, yes? You mentioned EFT earlier. Like yes. EFT. Yes, um, I'm happy to take a demo. Does anybody have a fear with a known experience? Like a, a something that they can say, this is where I developed my fear. Anybody have anything? Fear of snakes, lizards, dark rooms, anything of that sort? No? All your fears are more intangible? Water? Yeah. Did you have a bad experience? Yes. I remember my tita, my aunt before, when, she would, when I was really young, she would bathe me and my cousin, and she would violently splash the water in my face. <laughs> okay. But prior to that, I was chill with swimming pools. Yeah. Like, as a baby, I was, like, totally cool with pools, but then I really, I mean, I, at some point, I just knew that I was afraid of water. And then when I try to like remember a more, you know, like the root of it, that's the only memory I can remember. Okay. Where I feel like, ah. Okay. Like and how does your fear of water play up? Like what happens? Do you avoid <sighs> swimming or? Oh, yes. You avoid the pool, yeah. the beach? I've gotten a little bit of progress. I can now willingly go into a kiddie pool. Okay. But like prior to that, that's not a lot of progress. <laughs> <laughs> but like prior to that, but prior to that, oh, but prior, yeah, prior to that, my, I think I was around, I'm 22 right now, and at, I think I was 17. My, I, I, I already had the fear of water, but my family dumped me okay. into the pool. Okay. And uh, ultimately, I am full-on panic attack in front of my whole family. Oh, wow. So that's so real, that real is fear. progress for me. That is progress. Okay, come on up. <laughs> okay. I'm going to teach you a little bit of EFT, okay? okay. What's your name? Bea. 
Bam. Yeah. So may I use you as a demo? Sure, let's go. Okay. No no hard work, okay? <laughs> Very chill. Okay. Okay, you're gonna take your hand. Either. Either hand. Okay. okay. And this is what we call is your karate chop area. Okay. okay. I want you to rub it. Okay. okay. Now I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Uh -huh. And remember, would you say being dunked in the water was the most, you know, traumatic? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want you to think about that experience. Okay? And I want you to repeat after me, even though. Okay. Even though. I feel. I feel. So afraid. So afraid. Tell me what else you felt. Ye I just felt like I was going to die. Even though I felt like I was going to die. Even though I felt like I was going to die. I was so scared. I was so scared. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. It was so scary. It was so scary. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. Even though. Even though. I was afraid I was going to die. I was afraid I was going to die. Still I choose to. Still I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. That unhealed part of me. That unhealed part of me. Even though. Even though I was so afraid, I was, I was so afraid die. I was gonna die. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. That unheal part of me. That unheal part of me. Even though. Even though. I thought I would die. I would die. I thought I would die. I would die. I thought I was gonna drown and die. I thought I was gonna drown and die. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unheal part of me. This unheal part of me. Okay, now both hands on your no. chest. Seven deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Seven counts. Seven rounds. Eyes closed. Okay, you can return to normal breathing. And I want you to remember that incident, okay, of being thrown, dunked into the pool. And tell me how you feel now. I, I kind of want to laugh. Okay, that's good. Now give me one to ten. Yeah. How bad the fear feels at this point. Ten being the worst. Maybe a good five. A five? That's a good five. Okay. Now, what's the feeling with respect to water? Think about water. Think about like a big adult pool or like the ocean? Ooh. Pool? I'm afraid of pools, but the ocean I'm not afraid of. Okay, so think about a pool. Yeah. Okay, can you imagine it? Yes. What's your level of fear? Ten being the worst. Oh, that was a seven. That's a seven. So fear went up when we brought in the pool. Yeah. Okay, and what do you feel when you're thinking about the pool? I remember the memory. And what do you feel in that memory? Now I'm just afraid someone's going to dump me again. Okay. And what's going to happen if they dump you? I might drown. And then what will happen? I die. Okay. So yeah. even though, we're going to do the even though again, you're going to, yep. Even though. Even though. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I will get dumped. I will get dumped. And I will die. And I will die. I'm afraid of being pushed into the pool. I'm afraid of being pushed into the pool. I'm afraid I will die. I'm afraid I will die. Still I choose to. Still I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Even though. Even though. I'm afraid I will die in the water. I'm afraid that I will die in the water. I will drown. I will drown. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. Still I choose to. Still I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Even though. Even though. I'm so afraid. I'm afraid. So, so afraid. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. I'm afraid I will die in the water. I'm afraid I will die in the water. Still I choose to. Still I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. That unhealed part of me. That unhealed part of me. Okay, hands on your chest. Seven deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Take deep breaths. about the pool again. Okay. How do you feel? It's okay. Okay, give me a number, one to ten. Three. Three? Fear yeah. down to three? Yeah. Okay, I want you to imagine just kind of sitting at the edge of the pool. That's chill. Your legs are in the water. That's chill. Okay, I want you to actually get into the water. Okay. How's the fear doing? A little, ooh, okay. a little shaker. Give me a number. Four or five. Four to five. Okay, yeah. and what's the feeling now that you're in the pool, in the water? 
kind of feel tingly. Tingly? Yeah, I kind of feel tingly. Okay, is that a bad thing? I think uh, I'm just remembering the trauma. Okay. What there. Now, what's the feeling of the trauma? Oh, feels like I'm. Feels like my, if it's just my lower half in the water, then that whole part is just frozen, and that the whole upper part of me can just like move. Okay. So let's start. Even though, even though I feel frozen in the water, I feel frozen in the water. I feel panic. I feel panic. Frozen. 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 Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to heal and integrate this unhealed part of me. Heal and integrate this unhealed part of me. Even though, even though I'm still frozen. I'm still frozen. I am helpless. I am helpless. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to heal and integrate. Heal and integrate this unhealed part. Of this unhealed part of me. Even though, even though I feel so panicked. So panicked. So frozen. So frozen. 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 Still I choose to. So I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Okay, hands on your chest. Seven deep breaths. in the water. Yeah. Water's up to your waist. Okay. How do you feel? I kind of want to go deep. Okay, go just deep. just want to sub submerge, submerge my head like real quick. Okay. Just to check it out. Check it okay. out. Okay. Submerge your head. How do you feel? Ooh, weird. <laughs> What's the weird feeling? Different. Okay. Give me a number of the fear. A two. Two. Point. two. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay. Can you swim around a bit? I don't know how to swim. Okay. Can you walk around a little bit? Yeah, I can. Is it comfortable? It's okay. Okay. Any fear? Not much. Just weirdness because it's yes, new. Yes, just weird. Because, you know, it's when you're walking, you feel air. Now you're in water. So okay. you feel a little more restricted. Okay. Say, even though. Even though. I feel restricted I by feel the water. I feel restricted by the water. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Even though. Even though. I'm restricted in water. I'm restricted in water. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Even though. Even though. I'm restricted. I'm restricted. I feel restricted. I feel restricted. I feel constrained. I feel constrained. Still, I choose to. Still, I choose to. Heal and integrate. Heal and integrate. This unhealed part of me. This unhealed part of me. Seven deep breaths. Okay, you're in the water. Yeah. You're submerged. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? It's okay. Give me a number. One. I'm happy with one. <laughs> <laughs> that feels. Oh, I don't like opening my eyes after my long thing. Oh. Okay. You're gonna go in the water. Yeah. You're gonna take my number. And you're gonna message me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I probably can. My, my phone's waterproof. <laughs> Thanks no, you don't have to message me. <laughs> you know what you're going to do? What? You're going to post it on our Instagram. Okay. Or you're going to give me a, a testimonial. Okay. And then we will post it from this talk. Sure. Okay? And we'll see how she really did after this. Okay. Okay? But I'm pretty confident her fear would have been resolved because it's an easy one. We have a triggering incident. You know, and we just work through it, going through all the emotions and clearing. And she should be actually very comfortable with the water. Okay, now she'll have to take swimming lessons if she really wants to swim. <laughs> that I cannot teach you, you know, in that. But, you know, it's a good start to be yeah. able to actually get into the water feeling safe. All right? Okay, guys, thank you for joining me today for the Conquering Feast Fear Seminar. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. And definitely we appreciate your feedback. And um, anything you would like to share with us from these talks that I do, we'd love to hear that.